last four to five minutes. And after that, there were questions and answers and <coughs> session. And after that, everybody dismissed. And only Dr. Leifer, Tim, and I will be drilling him in a private session. So, uh, hold your, just pray for him. And, and <laughs> <laughs> so, let me, let me just pray. Let me just pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for bringing Derek to this point in his life and just ask you to give him peace and uh, uh, be able to, to convey this material as, as he works so hard at it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Come on, Derek. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming. My topic is development of the ceramic to metal microwave soldering process using numerical simulation. And this is for a Master's of Science in Materials and Materials Program Engineering, partial fulfillment of that. <coughs> My advisor is Dr. Yanni Adani. My thesis committee members are Dr. Adani, Dr. Sun Kim, and Dr. Paul Leiker. And so I'm going to just, before I go any further, just read some personal acknowledgments, and then I'll go into the actual thesis. First, I want to thank my God and Heavenly Father by whose providence and goodwill I've come this far. I have tried his patience and he has proven faithful beyond what he could ask or imagine. Second, I thank Julie Ormsby, whose words of affirmation during my employment in the medical columns set the stage for my work here and go with me still. Her testimony and work was so strong you could see her faith without even hearing her say the name of Christ. I also thank Coyote Oyedemi, whose example has given me a reason to keep going. He has helped me in this effort by always being an encouraging friend and inspiring colleague. I thank Dr. Yanni Adani and Dr. Sun Kim for bearing with me in all seasons, all the while directing me throughout this arduous project. I also thank Dr. Adani, my advisor, Stephen Wilson, Judah Rutledge, and Rebecca Hoyt, my mother, for reviewing this thesis on very short notice and giving me invaluable criticism. Finally, I thank the friends and family whose names would double the length of this note to mention completely who have prayed for me, encouraged me, and listened to me while I undertook this work. You've taught me what it means to be a part of the family of God. So, I'm going to briefly go over the contents of this um, uh, defense. First of all, we'll have an introduction to microwave heating, a review of the microwave joining processes out there, a statement of the problem, and then the proposed solution and objectives, the numerical approach taken, the experimental approach, discussion and um, additional discussion observations um, on the results, and then conclusions. <clears throat> First of all, some background and theory regarding microwave heating, particularly single mode plasmaless microwave heating. I'll try and define all these terms very clearly. First of all, this uses the same frequency that exists in your um, kitchen microwave, and it works by the propagation of the microwave from the generator down the waveguide and is reflected by some um, reflective um, wall on the back and it creates a standing wave pattern. And so this is a single mode um, microwave applicator and I'll um, differentiate between single mode and multi-mode in a little bit. This produces a standing wave as I said, which if you take the electric field and the magnetic field components of the microwave, um, produces this uh, periodic pattern of uh, high and low intensities or hot spots. Um, due to the constructive and deconstructive interference of the wave upon itself. And so heating occurs when there's a coupling of the wave to the target, and it occurs in lossy materials, materials that um, are susceptible to microwave heating and will generate heat due to the ma molecular microscopic interaction of the wave with the material. And the kind of heating that um, is being utilized in this work is plasmaless heating. <clears throat> and so Plasma forms when there is a, um, a breakdown of the electric field um, around particularly the target or a, um, a metal um, um, fixture in the waveguide. And this produces uh, extremely rapid heating that's not easily controlled. It can produce dangerous thermal gradients. <coughs> so briefly, single mode versus multi-mode microwave applicators. Here on the left you have a single mode waveguide and the right, a multi-mode chamber. Now there can be multi-mode waveguides and single-mode chambers, but this is the terminology I use to differentiate. The main difference is there is a single incident wave um, that meets the target in a single-mode waveguide, and there may be a reflected wave as well. And in a multi-mode chamber, there are multiple incident waves. <coughs> so by using the single-mode 
um, apparatus and the constructive and non-constructive interference pattern stand away, we can selectively heat different materials with different properties. And so using the electric field, the um, uh, dielectric materials experience losses. And this is due to the imaginary permittivity um, component of a complex permittivity. And an example might be water, which has a dielectric constant of 80 and about a um, imaginary permittivity of about 40. And this heats um, fairly um, rapidly, and it's the particular frequency that your kitchen microwave is tuned to this particular material. So that's why it's used in this application. <coughs> in addition, different materials heat via the magnetic field of the microwave. And this may happen through the eddy current uh, loss mechanism, where um, electric currents are induced on metals and conductive materials, particularly of small size, um, bulk materials and small size materials. But only when you get to a very particular, small particular form is the heat, um, the loss is actually substantive. <clears throat> in addition, magnetic materials experience losses through the hysteresis effect which happens in magnetizable materials when there's a remnant field um, and that produces basically a path that can't be returned upon. And so you have this area that's traced out in the hysteresis curve by magnetizing and demagnetizing the rapidly changing field. And that area represents the losses in magnetic materials such as ferrous oxides. <clears throat> and so using the, select, the, the standing wave pattern I showed you in the electric and magnetic field, if you place a target in a particular position in the waveguide and move the back wall of the waveguide, then the electric field intensity represented by the blue line and the um, magnetic field intensity represented by the orange line in the, at the target location can be varied. And this intensity for an empty waveguide with no um, distortion caused by anything present in it um, basically follows a sinusoidal pattern that is exactly out of phase with each other where the two fields this gives us the potential application to be able to selectively heat in only in the magnetic field or only in the electric field. <clears throat> there are some advantages um, to using microwave heating for joining processes. And the most significant one is that microwave energy produces heat directly in the material. So take an arbitrary joint where you have the base materials and the interlayer. Um, microwave heating can be used to apply heat directly at the interlayer or at least internal to the base materials themselves, whereas conventional processes, either, non either contact like a soldering iron or non-contact, um, uh, transfer heat to the joint from the outside. And so you have this inside out versus outside in <coughs> effect. And basically, microwave heating gives you the advantage of a contact process by being efficient and applying the heat directly to a particular part, but also the flexibility of a non-contact process by not being as limited, perhaps, to joint configurations that a contact process may be limited by. And so, particularly for joining of ceramics to metals, there are several advantages that come out um, and why we would use microwave heat. For one, ceramics are prone to thermal shock. If they're heated too greatly, too rapidly, um, if the thermal gradient is too great, it can cause um, stresses that can cause failure and cracking. <clears throat> in addition, between uh, the interlayer, between two materials of very dissimilar nature, there tends to be a molecular tra an atomic transport that occurs mm -hmm. across the interlayer. And it will produce often intermetallic compounds at the edges of the base materials that will weaken the joint and reduce some of its properties. For instance, the thermal conductivity, the electrical conductivity, those are important for the particular application. Also, many traditional processes like um, a furnace-based soldering will apply a lot of heat over a long period of time in order to make sure every joint is made, but in the process, um, solder can overrun um, in many of the joints and cause problems that will reduce the life. In addition, ceramic to metals have very different, um, they have different thermal properties and they will expand differently. Um, as they're heated. And so there's a fundamental mismatch in the coefficient of thermal expansion between them. And when they're heated and joined and then they cool, often the metal will, um, it will contract much more than the ceramic will, and this will produce stresses at the joint, which can cause failure in the ceramic. <clears throat> but there are several disadvantages to using microwave joining. For one, the formation of plasma is difficult to avoid unless you remove every molecule of air from the uh, 
the medium. In addition, the heating mechanism is very nonlinear, and the material properties that govern them change significantly with temperature. Um, for example, the uh, hysteresis effect only operates up until the Curry temperature of the particular material is reached, and then you don't have that form of um, that heating mechanism anymore operating. Also, microwave heating is fundamentally target dependent, and so based on the properties of the material and the size and shape of the target, um, the heat, heating will be very different because the degree of coupling to the material will be different. All of these aspects make microwave drilling equipment difficult to design and often specific for a particular application, very specific. And also the process is hard to control um, because all these, all these variables can change within that process. <coughs> So it is incumbent really to look at what the scientific field is doing in this area and what other um, uh, means of joining materials using microwave energy exists. And so we can differentiate them based on material combinations and I'm going to overlook polymers completely um, because that's fairly well established even commercially you can buy microwave welders for um, joining polymers. But particularly in the research field is focusing on joining metals to metals ceramics to ceramics, and ceramics to metals. <clears throat> and all of these present their own unique challenges. Different joining processes are used where we're talking about directly welding the base materials or brazing them using some uh, interlayer that will melt and bond the two. <laughs> Soldering, which is just a lower temperature than brazing, above or below 450 degrees Celsius. And cladding, where you have a, um, a metal that's applied on top of another to give it corrosion resistance. <clears throat> and there are several techniques that are used to um, produce this heat, and some of them are direct and some of them are indirect. And so I've kind of boiled it down into three, and th there are more. You can, you can make it broader than this, but this is kind of represents generally what exists out there. And so there's this technique called microwave hybrid heating, and I'll explain that um, shortly. The direct heating of the base materials themselves, and then direct heating of the interlayer. And so I think it would be helpful to just to illustrate what the difference between direct and indirect heating because this really comes down to the, one of the most unique important advantages for microwave heating. Direct heating happens when, let's say, you have a your target, your uh, joint that you want to heat, and um, you uh, the microwave energy uh, reaches it and it is coupled to the target. It absorbs it, it's absorbed with the microwave energy, and it heats from generally from the inside out. This is what I would call coupled condition. In another situation, you may have a, a target of very different properties, and when the microwave meets it, some might be transmitted through if it's transparent to microwaves, or some might be reflected. <clears throat> this is a not coupled condition. And in such a situation, um, for example, microwave hybrid heating, an external susceptor is needed, an external material piece that will um, preferentially absorb microwave energy is used and it is transferred radiatively or conductively usually to the target and then it is heated from the in outside in. And so the difference there is it is generated directly in the material or not directly in the actual target. <clears throat> so technique one can be illustrated thus. There is a, usually it's perform, performed with a multi-mode chamber and um, there is some ins heat insulative chamber in which the joint is placed and an ex a susceptor external to the joint that will absorb microwave energy. The base materials may be highly reflective to microwaves, for instance, metals. This is the only technique that's used to join metals to metals using microwaves. And this interlayer is, um, if, there, if it's some kind of brazing and soldering process where the joint materials may not be melted, um, this is heated and the heat is um, transferred to it directly from the susceptor, but not directly from the microwave material interaction. So it's generated the susceptor and transferred to the joint. This is the most flexible of all three techniques. If you think about it, there's not a lot of limitations in terms of joint um, type configuration, and it's the least advantageous because we're not actually directly generating that heat in the target itself. <coughs> it, it lacks the advantage of volumetric internal heating in the material of the joint itself. Technique two is where the base materials will be directly heated by the microwave. And so oftentimes this is done in a single mode wave guide, not in all cases, but oftentimes. And 
you may have two base materials extending into the waveguide, and where they meet is, is where the energy is focused, and the base materials generate heat. This is internal an example of internal heating, so it is more advantageous than the first technique. But it's limited by the base material properties, and so it's less flexible, and we can't use as many different types of materials, as many different joint configurations, shape, size, etc. <clears throat> Technique three is where there is an interlayer that is um, between the base materials and selectively heated by them. And so in this um, method, the heating is targeted right at the interlayer. It's most advantageous of all these three techniques, but it is the most limited um, in terms of the base materials and the interlayer itself. It has to be susceptible to microwave heating. And there's the most limitations in terms of the joint size and shape configuration of this method. <coughs> For all these challenges, um, all these techniques um, did illustrate the different challenges that exist in microwave joining. And some of them have been met using um, the aid of numerical simulation. And so a brief survey of this work in the literature reveals that the finite element method in particular has been used to um, provide insight into the um, generation of heat and the micro-material interaction. For example, if you look at this figure, this is a single mode waveguide, and this is the electric field um, distribution where these circles represent in greater and greater intensities of the electric field. The uh, liquid containing tubes are centered in those, and this is the ideal arrangement. This is the design. Um, in reality, or in the simulation, when you take this and you um, model it, it is seen that um, there's actually a lack of coupling of the microwave to the tubes and where you thought the uh, electric field hotspots would be replaced, they have changed due to the distortion caused by the presence of the fluid containing tubes. In addition, um, FBA, numerical simulation in general, has been used to design and help um, design chamber um, applicators for microwave heating. And so an example would be um, this study where a fluid containing tube was um, uh, placed in a waveguide with horizontal and vertical sections and simulation and experiment agreed um, with the result that there was very little heat generated in the horizontal part even though there was much greater um, volume of that in the microwave, in the microwave waveguide um, than the vertical sections because of a fundamental, um, some of the fundamental characteristics of microwave material interaction. I'll get into that, um, the effect of the orientation of the target and um, theoretically what's behind that. <clears throat> In addition, numerical simulation overall has provided a pretty good prediction <coughs> of results for microwave heating of many materials, and one of those um, that's been investigated is different metal powders, and it predicts not only the, um, fairly well the final temperature, but also the um, profile of the, the temperature evolution of the, of the target. <coughs> So, there is a fundamental challenge here um, in terms of uh, wanting to join a ceramic to metal. And while there's much commercialized technology that exists for joining polymers, this problem is causing, uh, is preventing the um, commercialization of equipment for joining ceramics to metals. And some of the observations that have been made through previous work at Laterno and work I, that I have done are the following. Arc suppression is a problem. Um, unless you pull every molecule out of uh, the waveguide. Feed-forward variables um, are difficult to determine, and so, for instance, if you have a closed-loop control system where your heating is controlled via temperature feedback and also some parameters that you feed into it based on the materials you're using in the joint configuration, this is really dependent on knowing the material properties and how they're going to respond to the microwave. <coughs> and there's a limited amount of information we have with regard to that. Joint quality and reproducibility, as seen in the past, is not particularly well established. And fundamentally, the microwave material interaction is just not well understood. So the objectives for my work are to use numerical simulation to gain insight into the interaction of the microwave with the target, and to justify design change to the experimental apparatus. Also, a new prototype will be constructed, and um, it'll incorporate pressure and pressure application to the joint to aid in um, wetting of the solder to the base materials and improve the joints. <clears throat> and so this utilized an experimental numerical methodology uh, that can be illustrated in this manner. Um, 
I just want to point out that the blue arrows are not chronological steps. These are functional steps. And so everything starts with some experimental data. We have a characterization of materials and how they heat um, in the experimental apparatus, the microwave welder. And then that information, that data is taken to a, uh, a numerical model, a numerical model where the physical phenomena is simulated. And we see how um, the kind of interaction that the material has in the microwave. And we calibrate the model based on the heating data, experimental heating data, to find material properties that, are, we don't already, that I don't already know. And then this, is, this insight is um, used in the design of an apparatus to optimize heating and improve coupling of the target to the microwave. This prototype is modeled using numerical simulation and a prediction for um, using uh, selected process parameters and within a certain time and a certain temperature is made for the joining process. And then that prediction is validated um, using an experimental work. <coughs> and so I'm going to talk about numerical simulation first and go into the methodology for that. This is a set of material properties that I've used um, in the numerical models. I use console multi physics for the numerical modeling. And what I really want to point out here is that two properties were not, could not be found in literature, and I had to experimentally slash numerically determine. And so this is the approach I use to determine that. This just illustrates the approach for finding the imaginary dielectric loss of um, of a quarterite, which is an arbitrary dielectric material that was chosen to um, model and, um, the, and experimentally evaluate the orientation effect for microwave heating. And so um, this is the approach that was used. First, a model was created that replicates the heating experiment that was conducted. A parametric sweep is run to find the loss factor based on a final temperature that is known, that the temperature is solved for, and then we check that the numerical result matches the experiment. If it doesn't, this is repeated. If it does, then we know that this is the loss factor that is um, present in the material. And this is used in a new model, so it's, this loss factor is used to calibrate a new model that will um, be used to study the orientation effect in this particular example. <coughs> and that the results of that model are taken and they're compared to an experiment. And so the experiment uses the same geometry of the chamber, et cetera. And the experimental result is compared to the numerical results. If they don't match, then go back and try and find a new loss factor. Otherwise, that validates not only this numerical model that was made with the calibrated data, but also the model used to find the um, loss factor in that approach. And this approach was also used to determine the, um, the loss factor of the magnetic loss factor of ferrite which will be important um, later in this work. <clears throat> and so this is the numerical model, the geometry of the model used to find the dielectric loss factor of quarterite. This is the quarterite brick. It's um, a piece that's used in a backing bar to put an underbead on a weld, um, but it was just an arbitrary ceramic that was readily available. And so basically the same parameters are used in the experiment, and it's um, the final temperature is found, and it's used to calibrate the um, other numerical models. <clears throat> so this data was used to s in the numerical model to evaluate the orientation effect. And briefly, the theory behind this is that um, can be illustrated with this diagram. So here's the waveguide, a cross section of it, and this is the top, the bottom. The electric field lines are um, they're going from the bottom to the top and the top to the bottom, vertically situated. And so as the incident microwave meets the material, the electric field produced is going to be equal directly outside the target and um, directly inside where the electric field line flux lines are tangent to the dielectric interface. Air is dielectric as well, so this is a dielectric interface. Where the um, flux lines are perpendicular to the dielectric interface, however, the electric field intensity in the dielectric target will be reduced by a factor um, equal to the ratio of those two permittivities. And since every permittivity of a dielectric material will be greater than air, there will be significantly lower intensity of the electric field strength of the target. This means that the vertically oriented target will heat more, much more readily than the horizontally oriented target. And so this is the geometry of the different um, uh, configurations of the numerical model for studying 
orientation effect. Here you have the dielectric target quarter right brick horizontally situated, and then two vertical arrangements, one that is orthogonal to the wave, perpendicular to the wave, and one that is longitudinally situated in the wave guide. So these are the designations I've given to those. This is the model for studying and evaluating predicting the solder joint and the heat generation at the interlayer, the base materials and the interlayer between. This is the, um, the model of the uh, prototype used for joining, and that will be explained in more detail later. So the results of this numerical simulation work. <clears throat> First of all, the evaluation of cordite and how it heats in the um, joining chamber in order to find the dielectric loss factor is um, shown with this diagram. You have electric field distribution taking an X Z slice um, through the waveguide and then temperature in the um, dielectric material. And you can see where the electric field intensity is greater close to the target. There is um, a higher temperature uh, in the target. And it's not very thermally conductive. So after 60 seconds, there's still a decent thermal gradient across it. This is the parametric sweep where we have the dielectric loss factor on the horizontal axis and the peak temperature after 60 seconds of heating on the vertical. And so the experimental value um, for this particular um, study was plotted on this orange dash line and where it intersects with the parametric sweep line. Um, that is the dielectric loss factor that we can say is a pretty good representation of this material. <coughs> The joining chamber and the simulation of the ceramic metal joint is shown here with the electric field plot and the XZ slice of the waveguide. And here you have the ceramic and metal um, base materials in the interlayer. And this dark blue is represented, represents a very low intensity of the electric field. And so what you can see here is that where there was a, a, you know, a very regular periodic hot spot pattern within the waveguide that has been distorted by the presence of not only the joint itself, but also the pressure applicator. The magnetic field um, slice plot shows a very similar effect. And so this raises the question, can we actually join metal and ceramic in this chamber, applying pressure and with these materials which are highly reflective to microwave energy without using um, an external susceptor? And it was determined that external susceptor would be necessary. And it, uh, you can observe here that the magnetic field intensity is um, sufficiently large near um, the joint itself that perhaps by placing a magnetic material here, we might couple the wave and generate enough heat that can be transferred to the joint to melt the interlayer and join the two materials. And so a new model was produced. And this uses a ferret susceptor. This is where the ferret comes in that I talked about before. <coughs> And so this will heat via the magnetic hysteresis mechanism to absorb microwave energy directly and then transfer that heat to the joint. And here are the numerical results I'm showing the electrical and magnetic field distributions, electric field and magnetic field. You can still see that there is you know, the, uh, the joint itself and the um, pressure fixture are reflecting the bulk of the energy in the electric field. However, there's enough um, high enough intensity of magnetic field energy within the susceptor itself to actually um, heat and then transfer that heat to the joint. And so looking more closely, we can see this, the interlayer, the ceramic and the metal-based materials and the ferrous receptor. And then this is from the heat generation um, uh, computation, where at the end of three minutes of heating, the interlayer has reached um, easily um, high enough temperature in order to melt the interlayer. So these results were taken to mean that this approach can be used in the experiment we can actually join the ceramic and metal using this method. So this is the me experimental methodology. <clears throat> I just want to briefly go over the schematic of the microwave welder apparatus. Um, here you have the microwave generator produces a microwave that's um, uh, conducted down this waveguide. It operates basically as a transmission line for all of you double E's out there. Um, so the isolator lets the forward wave pass and the reflected wave is diverted into a water load to protect the magnetron. And then we have the power meters, which measure forward and reflected power. The joining chamber, or um, in a different prototype, a, um, a chamber used to heat different materials. And a movable back wall. And so the joining chamber utilizes the longitudinal direction that was found to be 
um, that will be shown to be found to be preferred, <coughs> as well as um, incorporation of joint pressure and monitoring of the temperature of the target, and then changing the chamber atmosphere, purging it or pulling out the air or increasing the pressure inside. All of these things were important to incorporate in this um, joining chamber. In addition, there are several parameters, variables we can work with. We can change the, the microwave power. We can change the relative back wall position, where it's situated with respect to the target. And we can change the overall time of the process. And all of these were incorporated using temperature feedback in a closed loop control system that's been developed in a previous work. However, for the scope of this work, chamber atmosphere control was um, this was removed, and the closed loop control system was put to the side, um, discarded, so to speak. Um, it's valuable, but for this work, it was necessary to have a wider operating range in terms of the variables that we can work with, and that control system didn't provide that. <coughs> And so here's a photo of the whole um, apparatus. Just, here's the microwave generator, the waveguide, the joining chamber, thermal camera to monitor the temperature of the joint interlayer. So prototype one is one particular, um, is, there's one chamber that was used to heat different materials. And so it was used for characterization of material susceptibility, studying the effective orientation of the target, and also some of the first joint experiments that were made without pressure. And so here's a photo of that. I look inside with the lid drawn back, and there's um, a quarterite brick situated on the quartz <coughs> stage placed in the waveguide. Here's a configuration, a, a diagram of um, another experimental configuration where you have a metal powder um, being placed in this quartz crucible and um, being heated for a particular time in a certain power, and the use of microwaves in the quartz stage. And so the orientation study was done in this manner at the dielectric. Um, brick was placed in three different orientations, as has been illustrated in the numerical model. Utilized the same parameters as the numerical model in terms of power, back wall position, time, and uh, quarterite was chosen just as a readily available dielectric material. <coughs> the third prototype in this development was used for joining, was designed to um, join ceramics to metals and to incorporate the use of the longitudinal orientation, as has been already mentioned. And so you can see here in the picture, the pressure fixture um, extending from the side and it comes out on the other side. And the two um, uh, arms, so to speak, of that pressure fixture extend into the waveguide. They're made of materials that are um, relatively transparent from microwave energy, quartz and Teflon. So this was used for the joining validation as well as gathering thermal data for the numerical models to determine material properties. The methodology used for the solder validation Addition, um, is as follows. Uh, two, the two base materials were copper and lead telluride. The lead telluride is a thermoelectric ceramic that is coated with a diffusion barrier of nickel and gold. <coughs> the interlayer used um, is a SAC 305 that stands for the, the abbreviations for tin, silver, and copper. 96.5% um, tin, 3% silver, 0.5% copper. Um, solder and a type 4 morphology, and then um, also a petroleum based soldering plug was used. And so here's just the, um, the parameters for the different joints, the sizes and the power used, and time, and then uh, the relative back wall position. <coughs> and so this is the configuration of how this, the joint would sit in the waveguide, be placed in the pressure fixture with the ferrite deceptor next to the copper based material um, as the metal is going to be very thermally conductive. The results of the orientation effect study showed that longitudinal and the longitudinal orientation was preferred. This is where the greatest heat can be developed for the same amount of time, the same power, the same back wall position. And so here we can see as we vary the back wall position, um, the material heats to different degrees, um, different peak temperatures based on the orientation system, and particularly the vertical orientations will produce a lot more heat in the target. And this is this makes sense based on the theory that's been discussed. Um, the final temperature comparisons um, give you kind of a qualitative look at that. And then this was compared to the results of the simulation, where we can see that although the um, magnitude of heating developed in the um, experiment as compared to the prediction in the simulation differs significantly in the overall shape is similar, 
And so this is perhaps just a, um, there's a magnitude um, offset that is not being accounted for. <clears throat> and this is a graph of the simulated versus actual um, temperatures to give a comparison of how well the simulation represent, re represents reality. And so each of these are results for the horizontal, orthogonal, longitudinal orientations are graphed in here. And the more linear, of course, this is the better that correlation between simulation and experiment. And so this isn't an ideal co co correlation, but it definitely shows that the same trend is being captured by both the simulation and the experiment. <clears throat> and so the results of the solder joint will be discussed. The temperature measurement was performed using a FLIR T300 thermal camera, which was situated from above and looked down through a, um, a tube into the waveguide. Here is uh, the ferrite material shown. And this is an image shot at the very beginning of the experiment before um, the microwave was turned on, copper-based material, and then lead telluride. And then at the point of melting of the interlayer, this picture was captured, and here it shows the ferrite is significantly hotter and the heat is being transferred to the interlayer um, where it is melting. This graph shows the temperature evolution of the interlayer um, over the whole time of the experiment, as well as the prediction by COMSOL. And so, some things to point out, there's a rapid heating of the dielectric flux at the beginning because it contains um, polar molecular compounds such as zinc chloride, which heated rapidly and then dissipated. Uh, but overall, most of the heat was generated from the ferrite and it was transferred to the joint. Um, this is the orange dashed line represents the melting point of the solder used. And as we can see, um, where that intersects, a phase change occurs and it's, it's starting to melt and the heat in different places. And so um, that temperature response changes uh, accordingly. The final prediction um, was within 5% of the actual result achieved in the 5% of the overall temperature increase. And so the numerical prediction represented, represented fairly well what actually happened in the experiment. <clears throat> Three different solder joints were made, actually, as has been discussed. The first was made, they all used the same lead telluride-based material, but a copper sheet, a piece of copper sheet was used in the first one, and then um, a copper disc in the other two. The final experiment was made after the numerical model had been validated. The numerical model was adjusted and run at a higher power and over that three minute time span. And then the temperature um, versus time was evaluated and had picked a point that was um, enough after the melting point of the solder had reached according to the model that I would be fairly confident that it would join using that time and that power in the actual apparatus. And sure enough, it was successful. <clears throat> and so these joints were characterized in three different ways. Joint A was evaluated to compare the interfacial area that was bonded as compared to a previous joint made without pressure. Joint B was evaluated using a scanning electron microscope to look at the interface and um, uh, uh, check for diffusion across the interlayer, cracking of the ceramic, um, this bonding of the uh, ceramic with the solder, and to identify the different materials. And then joint C was tested for shear strength. <clears throat> so a comparison of the interfacial area that was joined shows that with a previous joint made without the use of pressure on the target, on the, on the joint itself, <clears throat> a relatively small proportion of the interfacial area, which are represented by the surface area of this copper, piece of copper sheet, was actually um, bonded. However, with the use of a pressure applicator, a significantly larger portion represented by this dark um, area. Uh, was actually bonded. And so with this increase, there's a five times increase in bonding area that was achieved by using the pressure fixture. Joint B was mounted in cross-section and placed in a scan electron microscope to look at the interface. This, these images were taken in backscatter mode to show the different, um, the contrast of the different materials based on the energy levels of the um, electron orbitals in the, in the atoms. <coughs> And so here you have a close-up of the interlayer with measurements, and it measured about 84 microns to give you an idea, perspective. The, um, the whole joint is 17 millimeters across, so that's an aspect ratio of 833 to 1, which um, is good in terms of achieving greater strength. And so here we have the different materials, the lead telluride, uh, the copper, 
the lead telluride appears brighter because it has heavier elements and they show um, lighter in these images using Backstetter mode. And then the diffusion nickel lead nickel gold diffusion layer and then the solder interlayer. Using electron dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, the material was evaluated at different points to determine composition. And the different base materials were confirmed, lead telluride here, nickel gold diffusion layer here, the solder interlayer here with mostly tin, some silver, copper is not significant enough to show up, and then some remaining um, elements from the um, dielectric blocks. <coughs> and then another point in the solder interlayer, the copper based material, and another point in the copper based material. And I just want to illustrate, um, bring out several things. Observe there's no cracking in the ceramic, um, very little apparent diffusion across the interlayer, and um, a good degree of bonding between the two materials. The joint C was characterized for strength. It was placed in a fixture based on a design found in the literature. Uh, load was applied to the ceramic part um, solely, and then the metal part was restrained. And this was, um, it was loaded up to the point that the machine could not handle any more. And so we know that the joint strength is at least one megapascal. <coughs> and then I just briefly want to discuss some variables um, and how they were evaluated in this study. The target is very significant based on the material properties. We've discussed how there should be selective heating in the electric and magnetic field based on this deconstructive and constructive pattern in the waveguide. However, when each of these materials is placed with identical parameters separately in the waveguide, we find the distortion of the microwave around the, around the target actually produces a peak in heating at the same point. Shape and size are very important. The area they present to the wave affects and reflects the wave more or less. Orientation is significant, as we've already discussed. The morphology is significant because as you change, for instance, the particle size of a metal, it will heat um, more or less, and this correlates to some work that was done in the literature where we can see there's an optimal particle size for stainless steel powders, and this is illustrated by the data I took using aluminum powders. In addition, the effect of the joint fixture um, is significant. Anything we put in the waveguide is going to affect the coupling of the target of the wave. And so using the same parameters here, Back wall only varied between them to get maximum heating in the target for each situation. Um, these are experimental, uh, we determined final temperatures, and they vary by a factor of two because of solely um, distortion caused by the pressure fixture in the waveguide. So conclusions of this work are that by adding joint pressure to the, to the microsodium process, the bond strength of the joint was increased significantly. Previously, this kind of a joint could be pushed apart with your fingers. Uh, numerical simulation provided the insight necessary to understand um, fundamentally the microwave material interaction in a better manner and how the target impacts that. The numerical simulation also was able to predict within 5% error the, um, the result of the experiment in the final temperature. Some future work that should be done, further characterization of this solder joint should be used. Um, thermal cycling is important for such um, a joint in electronics applications and determining the creep strength would be important as well as evaluating the electrical conductivity across the interface. Uh, some design changes to the prototype that could be made, the incorporation of atmosphere, <coughs> removing oxygen or removing the atmosphere completely or raising the pressure can decrease oxidation of metal particles and reduce the melting point of the interlayer as well as um, suppress arcing more effectively. Changing the waveguide structure could improve coupling of the target to the um, wave by use of perhaps an iris or a tuner, increased up tuner, <coughs> custom geometry, could be used in the waveguide for each particular joint type to improve that coupling. Ultimately, though, removing the susceptor, this will reduce process time and really utilize more completely the unique advantages provided by microwave heating. I just want to briefly acknowledge funding, $25,000 um, from the American Welling Society, and then previous support from the 26 Foundation, as well as ongoing support from the Lamb Research Foundation. And I just want to thank personally Dr. Donnie for his commitment to this research. Um, which has been tireless in these efforts to support my funding have gone above and beyond. All right, thank you. So um, closed loop is where you 
um, the, temp the feedback um, from the actual joint is taken, temperature that's developed in the joint, and it's continually fed back into the system, and then different variables like the power and um, back hole position are varied. And so it responds based on the um, response to the material and produces a particular um, heating curve that's desired and a particular result. However, I used a basically a more op an open loop approach, but that was um, guided by numerical prediction. So I used the model to, to predict a certain result, and um, taking that result and then using the same parameters in experiment, if they validate the model, then I can use the model in future work, and as I showed with joint C, um, to actually um, change the parameters and um, use those parameters and you know have a successful process or improve the process. So closed loop control works by continuously um, working with the process and changing it and adapting it. And the approach I took works by saying what's going to happen and then doing that. Thank you. Questions, please. Yes. Um, I mean, just because there are, there's such a high level of complexity and there are so many variables that you have to account for in the model, um, I'm sure that can be cumbersome. Yes. Um, do you think that the um, Do you think that the system could be improved by a closed loop system? Um, well, closed loop system will improve a specific process. So once um, different parameters, like particularly joint configuration or different materials, are locked in, um, and your design, your chamber design is locked in then you can determine, okay, this is the range of parameters that I can vary in the closed loop system, control system that will give me um, the response I need and be able to control that. So, yeah, I don't have a lot of control over the, um, the profile of heating, like holding at a particular temperature and heating at different rates at different times because it, my parameters are constant. And that's where a closed loop control system will be very valuable. Good, good answer. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, which properties of the base metals are important in deciding <coughs> which base metal the um, ferrite susceptor would be placed? Uh, well, the reason I place the ferrite susceptor next to the base metal based material is typically the metal is going to um, be able to heat more quickly without experiencing thermal shock, and it will also typically be more thermally conductive. In this case, those two properties are fairly similar for these two materials used, but it doesn't really matter. The ferrous receptor means we don't have to care about the metal and its properties because it's not actually coupling to the wave and generating the heat itself. But what she has, I guess, is permeability, and they all vary with temperature and, and yeah. obviously the resistivity. And that, that makes, it, that makes the, the, the model extremely complicated because it's an exponential variation of those properties with temperature. And by eliminating those variables, he basically simplified his model. That's why it works. I think it was really major contribution. Yes. Is there any experimentation with moving that peak around on either of the two uh, things being joined together? Would it make more sense to move that peak over on one side or the other? Yeah, yeah. Um, for instance, moving it from one <laughs> side to the other, is that what you mean? So there's, this is just one back wall position, but by varying the back wall position, I am able to move the peak um, but it's, it's, there's a limit to what can actually be um, achieved because basically you'll see this, this hot spot move down and then reduce intensity, reduce intensity, and then pop over here and then increase intensity, increase intensity. So it's, there's just a fundamental problem with actually coupling to the target um, that has to be overcome by using other methods. The back wall is, gives very limited um, range of control, and that was one of the few things we could change with the control system, the closed up control system. So that's why I removed it. Well, you choose. <laughs> um, so, have you thought about perhaps uh, having two upper uh, gener generators, or one on each side, that could like a uh, you know, projecting some sort of cross configuration, and then you could, you know, make sure that you have the hot spots on both sides, and they, they could be constructed or something. Uh, it's not quite that simple. Um, the wave is able, I mean, it's able to reach the other side. It's not fully reflected, but the reason there's an high intensity is because there's a, actually a back reflection on this pressure fixture and it's kind of a superposition of um, peaks. And so by adding another generator on the other side, which 
actually give us any further advantage except of being able to apply more power. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you said the pressure applicators are uh, uh, relatively invisible to the microwave. Yeah, relative is relative. Do you? <laughs> is that, is that, um, like you said the quartz and the Teflon, right? Are those the best options? They, in my, from my experience, they were the best options. But from what I've learned since then, uh, there are better materials. There's a lot of um, porous foams that are developed specifically for these kind of applications that actually have high strength and don't um, melt easily. That's what I was looking for, high strength and uh, low thermal conductivity to not draw heat away from the target and also uh, low melting, uh, high melting points. Well, we started with those for, uh, porous foams six years ago when, when the entire project started and we just kind of dropped it off, but the distortion of the field will still be there. No Unless they have a low enough permittivity. Well, yeah, we really don't know if the compressive strength would be enough. We tried it, and it wasn't that good. There's Puhau, Puhau's cousin, rather. Oh, yeah. We, we bypassed the international <laughs> trade agreements by <laughs> stealing some of that through his cousin who came to Austin. We don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, any other questions? Yes. Do you experience any interference? Uh, the harmonics of your center frequency on the microwaves? Oh, are you referring to what I did in the evaluation it made with the spectrum analyzer? I don't know what effect that's having. I'm still in conversation with the manufacturer of our generator with regard to that, and they told me, we really want you to take more measurements because we can't reproduce this. There's something happening at, like further up in the waveguide, or there's something happening right at the um, where the load is at a lower point. And so, I think it's, I, I handmade a, what, listen to this doubly, um, I handmade a, a transmission line, a coax termination in the waveguide. It's not exactly up to spec, and so it's um, band, um, band responsive uh, filtering uh, effects may be significant. So you were able to attenuate some of that? Um, I didn't try to attenuate any particular um, harmonic bands or the overall signal. Um, the purpose of that was evaluating whether the frequency was actually um, working for the generator and further up the waveguide. There was really just that center frequency and no harmonic bands. That's the difference. All right, so, yeah. Oh, yes, <coughs> Specifically with a ceramic to metal weld, how would um, internally heating the material help? Um, you know, not decrease the life of the weld because of the difference in thermal expansion? Well, for this, let's say like a solder or braze, um, if we could directly heat the interlayer and heat ceramic and metal materials very little, then they wouldn't experience that difference in thermal expansion. Um, that's one of the most important advantages. And so it would be better, it, you might not reduce the life by like 50% by the time you actually finish just the joining process itself due to the weakened strength that's produced by those stresses that are induced by the difference in thermal expansion between the well, materials. Maybe you want to comment on the fact that lead telluride is designed as thermoelectric to have very low thermal conductivity. So we, today they furnace braze them in 90 minutes because they are trying to avoid that thermal shock that would actually cause that. So a yes. microwave heating in a few minutes beats that, not necessarily from a productivity standpoint, but uh, four years ago, when we presented this work in Dallas to Two Six Foundation, they wanted to buy our prototype because there was no diffusion layer or already formed during those 90 minutes. It's just a clear boundary, and that basically is already half of the life of a thermoelectric because during soldering, it already destroys it with those really intermetallics. So that 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 really is a huge advantage to internal heating in addition to CP expansion. Anyway, uh, more questions. This is. Certainly more complicated than it appears, but I think that Derek's work uh, with numerical modeling brought more insight that uh, added significantly to Alan's work, so we're very, very pleased with that. Any other questions? We have five more minutes. If you have any. Yes. At the very end of your conclusions, talking about future work, you talk about removing the susceptor again altogether. Yeah. And from 
your thesis work, it looks like the susceptor was the key to actually getting sufficient heat. So how is removing the susceptor going to actually reduce process time? Because there, there's, a, there's a latency introduced by having the transfer heat from the susceptor to the joint. I mean, fundamentally, if the heat's not being generated in the actual interlayer itself, the time it takes for that heat to get to the interlayer is going to add time. In addition, by using the susceptor, I'm actually heating the base materials just as much as I'm heating the interlayer. And if I want to, I mean, lead telluride and copper don't have very different coefficient of thermal expansion, so it's not as much of a problem with this particular application. But if you're using something like aluminum to aluminum, for instance, that difference is a lot more significant and it could prove problematic. So if the heat can be generated right at the interlayer and the whole base materials don't themselves heat up, then not only is it going to take less energy and, and take less time, you're not going to have those problems that can be introduced by the different properties of the base materials. So it's more ideal. It's, I could also think of it as more scientifically pure to heat just the interlayer but itself. Judah, you might remember, I don't know if you were there with Alan, he started with particle size and distribution, magnetic versus paramagnetic powders at the interface. And when we discover that practically they are, uh, right now this composite, this particular dielectric for the powder is almost in, uh, invisible. It basically reflects everything. That was that was. We, we need to find a way to penetrate within that within that boundary, and we don't know how to do it yet. Maybe Kyle or whoever will start this. We we need to penetrate because it, it acts like a, like a reflector. That inner layer right now acts as a reflector, and we need to penetrate. Maybe changing frequency. We don't know how. But that's the idea, to, to, to keep melting that powder internally. Okay, one more question, and then uh, maybe we'll cut off. Yeah. Uh, would removing the susceptor and causing it to heat in the uh, inner layer, would that increase the bond strength as well, or would it just increase process or reduce process time? Um, perhaps if um, intermetallics were formed due to a longer process time, or um, the, the the base materials themselves were weakened due to um, stresses that are produced at the interface because they're both heated, um, then removing the susceptor would improve bond strength overall as well. Okay, well, no more questions. Thank you very much. For